Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic. A patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. On this edition, we'll learn about an immigrant homesteader and mail order bride. Visit a jewelry artist who uses precious stones in her art. And enjoy the romantic sounds of gypsy jazz. At 90 years of age, artist Charles Beck is still finding inspiration in the rolling hills, lakes, trees, and farmland surrounding his home in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Often described as abstract, his woodcuts depict his appreciation for nature and its many colors. We visited with Beck about how he sees nature and how his vision resonates in his art. You gotta live a while before you can make a living as an artist. A lot of times a woodcut print up close doesn't look like much. Uh, it looks just like a series of different colors and all that. I, you, uh, you sort of have to get back a distance so it gets to be, so it gets to be in focus. I have been doing woodcuts, you know, for six years. I usually will see something when I'm driving and see some hay. Yeah. That could be, a, could be a woodcut, or it could work as a work of art. And I don't photograph it, or I don't uh, uh, sketch it, or anything like that. I just remember that the general idea, and through my experience of looking at nature, I'm able to imp improvise it. And, and, and by doing it that way, it has a tendency to be a little more creative, a little more original. I think he captures so much in his uh, prints the scenes of the outdoors, um, where he gets the, the landscape, you know, you'll get the rolling hills and you'll get some trees and you might even get some cows in the picture. I mean, it, it brings such a, um, a reality of what is out there for you to be looking at and sometimes you don't always see it. It's nothing better than to, to be able to create something that you look at and, and someone will say, well, I've never seen anything like that before, you know. Well, that's the essence of it. It's new, it's, a, it's, it's an enlightening and uh, exciting. Well, I was born in uh, Fergus Falls. I seem to remember a drawing ever since I was uh, very young. And uh, I remember in grade school, I used to draw uh, pictures of uh, Indians and cowboys and things that interest me at that time. And then in uh, high school, I drew pictures of athletes. I had no idea about art at all when I went up to uh, Concordia College and got connected with Cy Running. He took me out sketching and drawing and uh, farm scenes and things like that. that. That got me started to be interested in the environment, the things around me, or subject matter. An artist needs a, an idea to, if he's gonna do a painting, he has to be interested in something. And that was my interest and it never left. It's a thrill to know that people really like it well enough so that they're gonna buy it and hang it in their homes and enjoy it. It's a beautiful day. I don't think I'd make it without her, uh, all the things she does. We've had good lives together. We appreciate what each one does, mostly the business part of it I do. And um, sometimes he'll ask me for a little advice on something. She's gotten to be pretty uh, perceptive about what makes a good uh, print, what makes a poor one. I'll 
tell them maybe I like it mostly, but for certain areas, I think I'd change this or that, you know, and whether he accepts it or not, that's up to him. There's a satisfaction of uh, ending up with an image like this here, and you say, well, this, if it weren't for me, this would not have existed. With uh, woodcuts, you have to be pretty specific about what you're going to do. A woodcut is kind of like a painting, except you carve your, your image on a piece of wood. The main thing is to have sharp tools, and the things that I don't usually have are sharp tools. So um, I get kind of a rough finish, but sometimes that's a, a plus. And then you roll paint on the wood. It isn't really a paint that I use, it's called a printer's ink. And it's a relief ink, especially for woodcut printing. The uh, paint adheres to the area that is not carved out. And in this case, I'm just rubbing it with a uh, spoon, which is how I did all my carvings back in the early days. I now have a press, so you run this through a press and it saves a lot of time. So what you need is an image that's kind of opposite of uh, what you might do in painting. You see here where you get the texture of the wood, and sometimes that's a bonus. You carve it all, but you're still not sure what you've got until you print it. And you, when you print it, you find out that the image is much different from what you had planned. So you either change it or, or carry it into a little different direction uh, based on what you've already done. I like to think that I, my main concern is to create decent uh, art uh, and uh, be myself as much as possible and uh, uh, create works that are uh, based on me and my reaction to nature. Singer-songwriter Elisa Karen of New York Mills, Minnesota, writes original songs about historical figures and events of the Northern Plains. One such figure is Rachel Kaloff. She traveled from Russia to North Dakota in 1894 as an immigrant homesteader and a mail-order bride. Her story is a riveting and candid look at the hardships of life on the prairie. Russian powder keg abandoned by my father. My mother was dead. Unwanted but to care for my brother's fight. Took another woman's passport for a one way ride from a hard life to a new land. I became a mail order bride. saw my husband on the New York dock come to take me to his North Dakota farm separate births on the endless train we disembarked on a featureless plane hard land for a new life as a man flower sack over my head on my wedding day I was blind at least they couldn't see me cry new land same hard life for a mail order bride one room winter shack with my husband's parents brother and Chickens under the bed, calf in the corner, cruel cold from the cracks. A hundred winds couldn't relieve the stench. I begged the gray skies for winter to end. Hard life in a new land, just another mail order bride. Tin pans, my mother-in-law put.
put a flower sack over my head on my wedding day i was blind at least they couldn't see me cry new land same hard life hard life in a new land hard land for a new life Shelly Fenske of Glendon, Minnesota, compares the art of jewelry making to sculpting as she forms metal and precious stones into one-of-a-kind pieces. Her jewelry reflects her love of nature and her passion for creativity. Found objects and the assembly of things are just such a strong part of me as an artist and what I create. A lot of my work is very primitive. Um, I love neutral, natural tones. Like a piece of amber, it's like when you pick it up, it's just such a warm color and it's got such a glow to it. When you're working with the elements of art and thinking about the color, the texture, the line, the shape, I'm really influenced by thinking about the whole piece. And so I'm always um, very conscious of the positive and the negative space. So I'll try to create works where the light can pass through the amber. The stone really drives the design. When I see the stone, I will trace the stone on paper and go from there and start working with a design, you know, that I think will accent the stone so that the stone is still the focus. I'm always interested in fossils. I think the first time I heard that amber was actually tree sap. And you know, that it can be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. The fact that amber is, is just this precious thing from the past that actually is like this looking glass to the past, you know, and you can see the things that are trapped in it. It's just another part of the beauty and the natural part that I appreciate. I think the fact that I grew up in a small town I was the little tomboy. I was always out there in the pasture, you know, helping them fix the electric fence and get the wiring tight. I loved the working with the metal. I just got so attached to it. So as a kid, I didn't even know that I was, you know, working towards that in my life, but I really see that as being um, a strong influence. Jewelry making is really sculpting in a much smaller scale. You have to make sure that you're thinking about how you're going to hang that piece at the end so you have to do some more extensions on it than you visually would think the finished piece would look like. So you make a pattern. I'll take a piece of just a base metal then, the copper, attach my tracing paper to that and using a saw, just a little hand saw, um, cutting that out. I'm a putzer, I like to do you know, a little bit of everything rather than just kind of sticking to one thing and, and, and continually doing that over and over again. A lot of that comes from being a teacher. Because when you bring it up in this section, it actually goes from darker, because it's darker than this area. It's my 27th year at Glendon teaching. I teach this year six different classes and keep really busy working with lots of different mediums, lots of different processes. Pounce with the eraser a little bit, and lighten those parts up that you need to, and keep it clean. Oh, my students inspire me all the time, and at the high school level, it's always fun to see when they are inspired, excited, have new ideas. If you need an eraser, you need to come on up and grab one. We pulled out a couple more. This is such a crucial part. You can hear it getting all of that rough edge off. It's all to the touch. Once you get a, a look that's very smooth, you know that you're finished. I'm planning whether I'm going to have a polished looking piece or an antique looking piece. We need to make the copper pliable so that we can add the texture to it. 
I always wanted to learn how to do metalsmithing, so I spent a summer, took my vacation money and went to Bemidji and, and took a metalsmithing class, and that's where it all started. Once it's gotten a dull red glow, then you're ready to just quench it in the water. The pieces that I'm working with right now and the amber that I'm working with is fairly symmetrical and very thick. It's like a big, thick amber bead. I love the warm qualities you get with copper and brass with those pieces. At this point, we're going to heat our wire that we're using for the rivet. I love sculpture. I love teaching sculpture. And I really think that that's why um, jewelry making became such an interest to me. Yeah. Sculpting is just um, such a big part of my life. I think I relate to so many different parts of my life when I sculpt. And here's the rivet that I made. I'm going to insert that into here. And the very last part of this is attaching the amber to it. There it is. It's a very rustic kind of sculptural piece. It pleases me and it's my goal to make works that are durable and will last forever. And when I hear somebody that says, you know, this is the one piece I know I can wear and wear and wear and it's always going to be, you know, something that I'll treasure and I'll pass on. I've had that compliment and that, that made my day. The Clearwater Hot Club is a band dedicated to gypsy swing and traditional jazz. Their strong Eastern European influences include traditional folk and tamboritza music. Sit back and enjoy the unique sounds of the Clearwater Hot Club.
Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Dambeck. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.